Hello and welcome to Strat News Global and welcome to our special uh, three-part series on science and technology where we'll be looking at uh, the government science and technology innovation policy, at the geospatial data policy and the cyber physical systems mission. I'm Surya Gangadharan and this is the first in our technology series. Welcome to it. I'd like to introduce Professor Ashutosh Sharma. He is the Secretary, Department of Science and Technology, and he's going to be our uh, Sutradhar for the next uh, for the next three series. So, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Surya. So, what about uh, when we talk of science and technology innovation policy? How do you implement something like innovation? A very good question indeed. Uh, so, science uh, the policy is about science, technology, and innovation means innovation which is driven by science and technology. Uh, but it's the policy is also about doing good quality science and developing technology which is relevant for us with priorities of the nation. Now the question that you ask is, how do you implement innovation? So we must first understand what innovation means and a whole lot of people actually don't. You know, they think innovation is something, uh, something creative so you say, hey, you are so innovative and stuff. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's not that. Mm -hmm. So there are two different things that go on in science. The first one is invention. Now, invention, basically, if you think about this as a black box, uh, invention takes in money and resources and produces knowledge. Innovation is just the opposite. So it takes in knowledge and it produces money. Now, mm -hmm. it's a crude way of putting it, but basically, the knowledge is transformed into new socio-economic opportunities. That's innovation. Mm -hmm. So innovation is totally quantifiable thing, right? So you say, look, uh, how, how, what new opportunities did you produce? What is the economic impact of that? Uh, and so if you cannot measure something, you cannot implement it. Now coming to the point about, well, we know what is it you need to do for innovation. Use our knowledge. And we are very, we have very deep knowledge base in the country. Mm. How do we know that? Uh, we are number three in the world in number of scientific publications, which basically points to the basic capability of generating knowledge. Uh, it does not say anything about consuming that knowledge, yeah, which yeah. is the innovation. So then uh, we need to strengthen our innovation, which means our capacity to make use of knowledge to take it to the society, to the market, to NGOs, to wherever for developmental goals. So how do you do that? Well, of course, you know that last five, seven years, uh, startups have picked up in a big way. Yeah. Now, startup is a very special entity. Uh, if you think of a startup as this little pipe, uh, one end of it is embedded in knowledge. Mm -hmm. The other end is embedded in market. So here comes in knowledge, it gets transformed, and then it produces opportunity. So we need to push uh, innovation through startups in a big way. In fact, we saw that in COVID-19 times. Uh, you know, startups, they, they are very fast, they are nimble, they are hungry, they are driven by young people. Uh, right now, DST has about 150 incubators across the country, which incubate about 3,000 technology startups. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, uh, we did a third party analysis. It showed that in the last five years, they created 27,000 crores of new wealth and more than 60,000 direct jobs. Now, if we were to make this 10x in the next five years, uh, the impact would be huge. Yeah. Uh, and basically, you, are, you, you take in people who are full of knowledge and full of energy at the same time. They have understanding of market and knowledge both. Uh, and so this is one of the ways that you, you basically push uh, innovation. The second aspect of pushing innovation, of course, there are innovations which are of the kind which are, may not be high tech, but they are relevant, which are we call grassroots mm -hmm. innovation. They, you know, because some other country might not be looking at those innovations because they have no need for them. Uh, to give you an example, if you look at a farm in, uh, in Western Hemisphere, um, uh, Western countries, you know, these farms are totally mechanized, yeah. very, very big machines, big, big, but we have small holdings, we have limited 
muscle in terms of investment by a farmer. So you need a different kind of machine, uh, you know, you know, right? And the machines that don't replace people, yeah. but it makes it more efficient. Uh, so those are all innovations of a certain kind that need to be pushed. It also brings in a traditional wisdom, if you would. So we, we can't just discard because it's traditional, mm -hmm. but we have to build upon it. Uh, so make it better. You know, take the basic idea from how people have been dealing with these problems, but, but bring in science and technology in there uh, to make it better. Uh, so there's another aspect uh, of innovation, the, the traditional knowledge, if you would, uh, that you need to develop further uh, with technology and then use it. Uh, the third aspect of innovation, of course, is from the industry. Uh, so the established industry, they, not, they must not be risk covers. They must not be just importing everything, mm -hmm. but must have the confidence, the vision, and in fact, purpose in developing our own technology. So that's how innovation would actually come to market, mm -hmm. uh, right? So all of these uh, stuff is happening uh, simultaneously. So these are the inputs that go into your policy? Yeah, they, these, are, these are how to develop these is the matter for policy. Mm -hmm. Because see, okay, the policy cannot be a wish list. It must have an objective. Yeah. It must also have how we are going to achieve those objectives. What is the architecture? What is the structure? What are the processes that would make it possible? Which also includes ease of doing business, mm -hmm. which includes uh, you know, flexibility uh, in our scientific processes and institutions. It includes <laughs> empowerment. Uh, of different uh, sections that do science technology and also transform that knowledge uh, into tangible things. Mm -hmm. So all of that is part of the policy. But there's one aspect. Of course, the policy has uh, you know, many different chapters wherein you look at what the gap areas are uh, and then how do you fill them. Mm -hmm. So um, is this something going to be driven by the center or are the states being roped in? Is there some... Oh, absolutely. A very good uh, thing. You see, often science and technology historically has been ignored by states yeah. because they just they have maybe other priorities which are you know just closer to the ground. Yeah. And people often had thought about science being too exotic or elite. Is actually not that. Or displacing labor. Or displacing labor. All of this is uh, not not well founded. Mm -hmm. um, and and indeed, the developments of the future the challenges of the future would require that we understand science and technology and we leverage it fully. Mm -hmm. uh, keeping in mind, of course, India-centric aspects. So it's not about duplicating something yeah, which is yeah. somewhere else, but to have our own insight into it and use that. And so indeed, this policy you know, has uh, one of the very strong points, is that how do we bring in states uh, together to work on science technology with the help of center uh, which could be as simple as, look, states say, look, every state has some maybe different unique set of problems. It may be water here, mm -hmm. it may be something else there. If they bring these problems to us, we would connect them with the, with the knowledge centers uh, and resources in order to be able to solve their problems, to provide solutions. At the same time, they should also put in some resources and investment uh, in science and technology. So indeed, for this policy, we had uh, consulted all the stakeholders of science and technology and states uh, was one of those stakeholders that we wish to connect very strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier, it wa was not happening. Uh, yeah. So, um, is there a timeline for this policy because technology is dynamic? Indeed, technology is dynamic and in fact, we are even thinking about a policy about policies, especially science and technology policies. That they must not be just frozen and yeah, written once yeah. and for all you know, written on the stone. Uh, so there would be some aspect in the policy which says, look, we can revisit some aspects of it every year and update them. They, not the very foundational things, yeah. but you know, how they manifest, how, how they are translated in action uh, that still needs to be done more periodically. I totally agree that science and technology is very dynamic. Uh, in fact, the last policy on science and technology was 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, you know, they say future is not what it used to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right? It's been coming at us faster and faster, disruptively. Yeah. Uh, so many things you could not imagine 10 years ago, 
Uh, you have to be prepared for them. Uh, and that's the need for new policy, mm -hmm. uh, which ought to be dynamic. So just to get a sense of uh, where we were and where we are heading, uh, 2013, can you name two or three um, maybe technologies or policies geared to that era? To, you're saying, look, in 2013, uh, or indeed the beginning of the decade, there was, that was the first time the word innovation was actually started being taken seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, but it had not developed fully. Uh, all that development has happened since then that we see. In fact, even uh, DST itself did in the last five years more than what was done in the last 50 years uh, for innovation and startup and stuff like that. It's an idea whose time has come. So that was not there, mm -hmm. you know, was not understood that well in those days. But also look at now the new challenges, which were not understood uh, back then. Now look at climate change, look at uh, sustainable development, yeah. look at the rise of intelligent machines, look at the rise of uh, antimicrobial resistance, our needs for health. Now this pandemic has shown us uh, the whole of these, these are overarching challenges, if you would, of the humanity, mm. which would be forever. I mean, it's not just our generation. All the subsequent generations down for many centuries from now would be addressing these problems that we start today. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it is rise of disruptive exponential technologies, deep technologies, all of that were not in horizon just 10 years ago. We make a beginning now. This is not the end, but this is the beginning. This is the foundation based on which our future would be built. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the contrast from, let's say, just 10 years ago, yeah, uh, yeah. if you would. So uh, looking at that, uh, you, uh, when would your next, um, you know, hmm. uh, science and tech policy, uh, when would the updated version or the, you know? Well, so, you know, what they say, predictions are very hard, especially about the future. Hmm. Uh, right. But usual stuff has been that these things are revisited every 10 years. Hmm. So this is the fifth policy since independence. So mm. maybe not exactly 10 years, but earlier it used to take more time. Things were slow moving. But like I said, my own personal wish would be that we don't just, uh, you know, do it once for all and then wait 10 years. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, a more periodic uh, visiting uh, mm -hmm. the stuff and updating the elements uh, would be a more suitable thing. So perhaps just doing it every 10 years becomes a part of the history. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that happens. So when we look at things like innovation, uh, where would you place India uh, presently? Are we uh, somewhere at the, you know, um, somewhere near the front of innovation? Are we somewhere behind? How do we rank? Yes, yeah, so this is actually a composite question. I will tell you, okay, well, if you look at the number of startups, we are now number three in the world, mm -hmm. which is not bad at all because we climbed very, very fast. Yeah. Uh, like I said, 10 years ago, we were not into the game, but today we are in the game. Uh, and so if we were to continue this march, that we would not slip. Uh, okay, so there in terms of number of startups. Now, of course, you can also look at, okay, what's the total value created by these startups? then we would be a little bit lower than number three and then we need to make, uh, you know, greater progress mm -hmm. on that. But on the whole, I would say innovation is happening, is also happening as a mindset. Uh, you know, younger people today coming out of colleges, they are not as reluctant uh, to, to um, roll up their sleeves, take risk and jump into it. Is it? Of course. Today's youngsters. Today's youngsters, yeah, they are less uh, risk averse. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, see, our generation used to be just look for, you know, some a job, engineering, medicine, and then, okay, a job, preferably a government yeah. job, <laughs> right? But now there are opportunities because of economy opening up, liberalization and so on. Those opportunities weren't there earlier. Uh, so that's the reason and, you know, people are more globalized in their outlook, um, right? Even middle class now is able to take risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just coming back to this uh, timeline, you know, mm -hmm. um, you would expect that say in about um, three years, given the pace at which uh, innovation and technology is transforming, you may have to revisit this or at least do some, uh, you know, kind of fixing. 
Uh, yeah, well, like I said, the minor things could be addressed perhaps every year. More important thing now, uh, this overarching framework. You see, there are two different aspects of a policy, any policy. One is what is the overarching vision and framework. Mm. The other is the actual content. What I mean by content is, look, today it may be quantum technologies, tomorrow it may be something else, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? But the framework remains the same mm -hmm. uh, dealing with them. I'll tell you later, actually, an example of that framework uh, for cyber physical systems that we evolved mm -hmm. and how, what is the difference? How, why is it superior? Uh, and that, so that carries across. Tomorrow, maybe I look at green hydrogen or something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but a whole lot of that, the elements of policy uh, are actually portable. They, they are carried forward to different domains mm -hmm. that may arise. Uh, the content might change. Okay. So last question, um, how does the West do it? Do they also have uh, these periodic uh, S&T policies? Uh, how do they do yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different countries do it differently. And of course, everywhere the landscape of science technology is changing very fast. Yeah. Certainly, there are policies that countries put forward. And 10 years is just a good time to do that. Um, there are many, many changes, like for example, in science technology, how it is implemented in the US, for example, is done through National Science Foundation, yeah. which is similar to Department of Science and Technology here. And you know, what kind of changes are brought in? How do you look at the questions of speed and scale? Uh, how do we match the speed of, uh, you know, new technologies? What, what is it that they demand? Basically, you see, society as a whole always has a lot of inertia. So our, um, our growth is always linear with a small slope. But the new technologies do not give you that luxury of time. Yeah. It's a lot like, you know, the second wave, it just hits you and goes up very fast mm. before you are prepared for it. So disruptive changes are like that. Mm -hmm. A human brain so far in the history is not trained to deal with disruptive changes. It, it always deals with, you know, oh, I, I will make adjustments. Right, but there may not be time for adjustments yeah. when it comes to things like climate change mm. 50 years from now. You know, so, so these are things for which we have to be prepared now. And we have to be prepared in a way that is able to deal with uh, disruptions, is able to deal with the speed of those disruptions. We often talk about new normals. Yeah. But if you were to ask people, they are still hankering after the old normal. Yeah. They think, hey, when will we get back to the old normal? <laughs> Little realizing that in this world, there is no one normal which is forever there. Mm -hmm. the, this idea of imbibing change and the capacity to deal with change, uh, that is behind all our uh, preparation for the future. So looking forward to our uh, innovation policy and how it is implemented. And I presume it is in the final stage now? It's absolutely it? in final stages. In the next couple of months, hopefully, that we release it. And then at the same time, we also have a plan of action to go with the policy. In other words, the implementation roadmap. Mm -hmm. So they'll simultaneously start on that. Professor Sharma, thank you very much. Pleasure thank you talking indeed. to you, sir. Thank you. Pleasure indeed. talking to you. And uh, so we come to the end of our first uh, series on science and tech, where we looked at innovation. Um, keep following us on uh, Twitter, on social media. Keep coming to our website and uh, track us on Instagram also. Send us your comments and observations. Thank you.